make sure I have. Friends, thank you for joining us today uh, for our special guest speaker series with Dr. Stephen Lambden, who's going to be speaking on the topic, It Came to Pass, Some Aspects of Prophecy and Fulfillment in Bobby Baha'i Sacred Scripture. Thank you so much, Dr. Lambden, for being here. Thank you, Nadal. Uh, it's very... Uh great for me to be here and I'm really pleased that everybody who's here has taken the time to come and um, I'll just share my screen now so I can remember what I'm talking about and get on as best I can should be there now yes so what I'm going to speak about today is the way that past sacred scriptures have been fulfilled in the Barbie and Baha'i viewpoint and the ways in which that has occurred and the importance for Baha'is and others to look into this particular subject. So motifs, themes and expository discourses expressive of scriptural fulfillment constitute one of the main or major dimensions evident within both Barbie and Baha'i sacred writings. They have it that past prophecy found in the Bible, the Quran and other sacred literatures has been, is being and will be in one way or another fulfilled. This matter is omnipresent everywhere in Barbie Baha'i sacred writings. In fact, I'll add here, you can hardly read any portion of Babi Baha'i writing without something being stated about the fulfillment of past expectations. In this respect, the Baha'i gospel is like that attributed to uh, the first of the traditionally four evangelists, the gospel of Matthew, in the sense that the gospel of Matthew tries to show to its Christian and other readers, constantly trying to say, it came to pass, it was fulfilled, as was spoken by a particular prophet. So the Baha'i message is like that, constantly reminding us that what has taken or will uh, take place is something which is foreordained and is indicated in often fascinating and interesting ways in books like the Bible and the Quran and the Hadith literatures and other writings. So, uh, Barbie Baha'i writings frequently have it that persons, history, new religious doctrines and associated eschatological, that means end time, latter day stuff and apocalyptic type events came to pass or will in the future in the not too distant future come to pass. This in a literal, sometimes literal, fully or partially realized manner. Sometimes prophecies are partially or slowly fulfilled. They don't necessarily happen instantly. That's why a great biblical scholar who will come to know in a few moments spoke about realized eschatology the realization to some degree of predictions which were given, say, before the time of Jesus, but would happen during his lifetime or subsequently. So realized eschatology is a technical term in the field of biblical religious studies. So things sometimes happen literally, sometimes not so literally, sometimes allegorically, and sometimes in other ways. So past scriptures fulfilled with the coming of the Bab and Baha'u'llah is a, a basic Baha'i belief. In the Baha'i view, a new era of gradual realization, emergent maturation and eschatological fulfillment is evident in human endeavor and by virtue of God activated changes, both apocalyptic, judgmental 
and millennials relating. Intimations of future messianic and eschatological events are numerous in pre barbie sacred writings. They are found in hundreds of places in the Bible, the Quran, and post-biblical and Islamic, as well as Barbie and Baha'i literatures themselves. Mohammed and the Imams and others too numerous to mention here, sometimes made amazing predictions as I'll illustrate, hopefully in a few moments. So the central figures of the Baha'i religion, the founder prophet Baha'u'llah was for roughly 30 years revealing writings, sacred writings in Arabic and in Persian. And those writings, as we've indicated, frequently contain reference to these past expectations and in one way or another their fulfillment. The same thing was done by his eldest son, Abdul Baha, for a period of roughly 50 plus years. And Shoghi Effendi, the guardian of the Baha'i religion, similarly made statements like this from time to time over a period of about 30 years. So it's well over a century that such materials have been given to humanity. And as we'll see, it's a duty of Baha'is to educate themselves in these matters, not only for their own enjoyment, relative to understanding the mysteries of the sacred books of the past, but so they can help and educate Jews, Christians, Muslims, atheists, others, Buddhists, Hindus, etc., to relate to the way that their religion fulfills things. So we could start, or I thought we might start with the name Baha'u'llah itself. It's believed by Baha'is that the name Baha'u'llah, which is a title assumed by Mirza Hussein Ali Nuri in the uh, 19th century, and that this name wasn't assumed for no particular reason, that that in itself is a fulfillment of ancient expectations more than a thousand years old, in fact, several thousand years old if you look at references to the divine glory, the glory of God, glory in the sense of radiant splendor is what the word Baha actually means, not glory in other ways. It's a radiant spl divine splendor which is being spoken about. And the fact that today the founder of a new religion has that particular title is not something uh, unusual or something unexpected. So there is a prayer, this particular prayer here in Arabic, Allahumma innani as'alaka min baha'ika bi abha'hu wa kullu baha'ika bahi Allahumma innani as'alaka baha'ika kullu. So that, those words which loosely translated is, I beseech thee by thy Baha, splendor, at its most splendid, Abha, for all thy splendor, Baha, is truly resplendent, Bahi. And so five different words founded upon the root letters, B, H, and A, are contained in the, that phrase which is the beginning actually of a prayer, a Shi'i Islamic prayer, as I've written above, more than a thousand years old, attributed to various of the successors of the Prophet Muhammad known as Imams, transmitted by the 10th Imam, but attributed to the fifth Imam who died in the year 743, quite a long time ago. And um, here's another uh, calligraphic rendering of that text. And as we'll see in a moment, Baha'u'llah refers to this prayer in very exalted terms. And what I put here is a great Shi'i scholar called Muhammad Bagheer Majlisi, 
who put together the massive encyclopedia called Bihar al Anbar, Oceans of Lights, cited by the Bab and Baha'u'llah numerous times in the Kitab i Yagan and elsewhere. He did this book, but he also wrote another book called Zad al Ma'ad, loosely the knapsack for the last days of the eschaton. So, this is the book you should have carrying around with you when the end of time happens, so that you've got a lot of devotional text at hand. And within this writing, this man, Muhammad Bagir Majlisi, who died in the year 1700 or so, says, as for the worthy, greatly respected supplication, the dua of Saha, dawn prayer, it has been related that His Highness, the eighth Imam Ali al Reza, stated that this is a supplication that His Highness Imam Muhammad Bagir recited in the mornings. He would say that if people knew the greatness of this supplication, the first bit of which we just read with those five references to Baha in it, they would fight with swords in order to be able to attain that prayer. And if I took an oath that the greatest name, Ismailat Zam, the mightiest name of God, is in this prayer, I would be stating the truth. He's writing this before the year 1700, about a prayer written more than a thousand years earlier than that. Thus, when you recite this supplication, recite it with all concentration and humility, and keep it hidden from others, lest his people, uh, from, from, from other than his people, God's people, in other words. It was such a sacred thing. Be careful about it. And when you recite it, it's indicated your prayers should come to fulfillment. And as Baha'is, we can see that this prayer is particularly important. And there are a number of tablets of Baha'u'llah referring to this prayer, and I've chosen two of them in which Baha'u'llah quotes that opening, those opening words. And he states or refers to this prayer as the tablet of eternity, Lohi Baha. And thou, i.e. God, made it to be the ornament of thine own self. Tiraz or Taraz Nafsikeh. And so Baha'u'llah confirms that the greatest name is in this prayer, just as Majlisi, basing himself on Islamic traditions, had stated. That's one tablet of Baha'u'llah. It's the tablet of eternity, this particular prayer. And another tablet, Baha'u'llah says, quotes it and says, who art aware of the waywardness of the people of the criteria, the Muslims despite the fact that they should be aware that the greatest name is mentioned in this Ramadan dawn prayer of Muhammad Bagir, they have signed a death sentence for Baha'u'llah himself. And so they, in this respect, they've gone astray. And so I wanted to draw your attention to these two tablets of Baha'u'llah relative to that ancient Shi'i Islamic prayer which is particularly sacred for Baha'is and which is something which we should pay attention to. Now, because this talk is supposed to be about prophecy and fulfillment, we find references to Baha'u'llah, to the glory of God in past sacred books. So the book of Ezekiel chapter 43, verse two, and the word for glory here is kabod in Hebrew, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like the noise of many waters, and the earth shined or beamed with his light, with his glory, his cabal. Now, one of the most important books for Baha'is, which we all study every day and try to memorize, is a book which contains much on these lines of prophecy fulfillment. It quotes the Bible, it quotes the Quran, it quotes traditions. And one of the beautiful passages in this book is about the rustling of the leaves of paradise. 
and um, it is not stated in the book itself, but it's clear from various things in the original Persian quoted Arabic texts that the book of Revelation in the Bible was influential upon Baha'u'llah in some of the things that he wrote in his kitab -e The book of Revelation, the Apocalypse, chapter 22, verse 2, says this, and the leaves of the tree, that's the tree in paradise, were for the healing of the nations. And Baha'u'llah speaks about the rustling of the leaves of the tree of his being planted in the city of God in numerous tablets. I'm going to refer to one of them here. That's the original Arabic text of it. And this is a loose translation, which I did some years ago. And I'll read here. When it, the lote tree, actualized its rustling, all things cried out, saying, there hath indeed come the intended one of the world, Maksud Alam in Persian, and the greatest name of Ismail Atzam, through which were opened the gates of mystic meaning and exposition. In other words, the mysteries of sacred books were made known as a result of the rustling of the leaves of the tree of Baha'u'llah's being. Now, one of the great Baha'i scholars, Mirza Abul Fazl Gulbai Ghani, whose dates are given there, there's a tablet, an early tablet of Baha'u'llah to him, in which Baha'u'llah refers to the main prophecy fulfillment issues within past sacred books. And I put the original text, which is still in manuscript, I think, and I translated it at the bottom of this particular slide, saying, there hath appeared he, i.e. Baha'u'llah, who hath been named YHWH, Jehovah, in a loose translation of the four letters of the Tetragrammaton, representing divinity. So there hath appeared this divinity in the Torah or Bible, this word occurs about 6,000 times in that book. And some of those occurrences refer to the person of Baha'u'llah. According to this tablet of his and other writings of himself and Abdul Baha. The Baha'u'llah goes on to say, and in the gospel, the comforter al muazi and the spirit of truth, and in the Quran, the great announcement, and naba al azim Quran 78 verse 2 that is. So here in this probably 1870s or 80s tap, 1880s tablet Baha'u'llah addressing Gulpai Ghani is reminding him about these levels of fulfillment. And Gulpai Ghani in the 1880s before the passing of Baha'u'llah already started to write Baha'i books about prophecy and fulfillment. And we'll come, if we have time, to that matter in a, in a, a little later. So this is a tablet of Baha'u'llah, a game which he refers to himself as the tetragrammaton. That nice word uh, means the four letters representative of the Godhead. And it is in a tablet to a certain Khalil, probably a Jewish convert to the Baha'i religion, in which this particular statement is made. In another tablet to uh, the Templar leader, Hardeg, Baha'u'llah again refers to the Mu'azi or the Comforter mentioned in the Gospel of John. And in this tablet to Hardeg, Baha'u'llah spells out by mentioning every letter in the word Mu'azi separately which when combined yield this word comforter, the coming of the comforter. No time to go into details about that. And in the tablet of Carmel, where Baha'u'llah went to close by this monastery, the, on the top of Mount Carmel, Baha'u'llah stood and he uttered out loud in Arabic his tablet of Carmel. 
And when he uttered that Arabic, it includes some citations from the Arabic translation of the book of Isaiah as rendered by Cornelius van Allen van Dyck, a Protestant Christian translator of the whole Bible published in the 1860s that Baha'u'llah was familiar with and which he often quoted as did Abdul Baha. And in the Tablet of Carmel, there's a citation. It's not in quote marks from the book of Isaiah about the realization of certain texts there. Now, we're moving briefly to Abdul Baha and his statements, numerous statements. There are hundreds of tablets of Abdul Baha, expository of the Bible. When Abdul Baha visited the West, the city temple in London in 1911, he wrote a beautiful rhyming statement. And this is my translation of the original of that. It's in Persian. And Abdul Baha stated, this is the sanctified holy book, Kitab al Muqaddas, Kitab al Muqaddas, redolent with heavenly inspiration, be wahi sama. It is the Torah of salvation, Torah in Najat. It is the glorious evangel or gospel in Jili Jalil. So you can see that Torah in Najat, in Jili Jalil are rhyming phrases. Then he says it's replete with the mysteries of the kingdom, Asrai Malakut, and the lights of divinity, Anwari Lahut. The divine bounty, Faizi Ilahu, having traces of lordly guidance, Asari Hedayati Rabbaniya, Rabbaniya. So that's what Abdul Baha wrote in that Bible in London. Sadly, that building, that church, and its Bible were destroyed in World War II. But somebody had taken a photograph of Ab what Abdul Baha wrote in that Bible. And this, this is the translation of that text. Abdul Baha exhorted the Baha'is to study the Bible. The, you could see in red here, undoubtedly the friends and men and women and maidservants of the merciful should know the value of the Bible. So Abdul Baha had a very high opinion of the Book of Revelation, which we referred to earlier, sometimes called the Apocalypse of John. That's John of Patmos, who was exiled into a Mediterranean island for being a Christian. And Jesus appeared to him in the spirit, because this was after Jesus's uh, passing, and dictated to him a book of the Bible, the Book of Revelation. And Abdul Baha quite often quoted and interpreted and referred to that. You'll know something of that from the book, Some Answered Questions. And in one instance, quoting Revelation 21 for Abdul Baha said, the Baha'u'llah hath wiped away their tears, kindled their light, rejoiced their hearts and enraptured their souls. So that book of Revelation, chapter 21, 22, predicts that the promised Messiah would bring a lot of joy and happiness. And this is what Abdul Baha refers to in this particular tablet. He says in that tablet, this is the truth. And what truth can be greater than that announced by the revelation of St. John the Divine? So if you haven't read it, it's not an easy book to read. There are hundreds of commentaries on this book which can be helpful. And um, within the Baha'i literature, there are quite a lot of interpretations of that book. Baha'u'llah quoted it and was influenced by it, as did Abdul Baha. So, Prophecy fulfillment is a very central thing uh, in the Babi and Baha'i religions. And in order for Baha'is to gain a deeper understanding of this material, 
it might be nice for them one day to get together and study John chapter one, which is not that long. You can read it together in about five minutes or so. And you can read the first chapter of the Quran, the surah called the surah of the opening. So read John one and surah al fatiha and Abdul Baha, the Bab and Baha'u'llah, in the case of the first chapter of the Quran, the kind of the prayer there, they all wrote commentaries upon that. So Baha'is have a very positive view of the Bible and the Quran. They don't agree with the centuries old Islamic view of tahrir, i.e. distortion or corruption. There are three or four references to corruption relative to the Bible in the Quran. But in the Baha'i view, they don't mean that the book is wholly corrupt. They mean that there's a distortion of interpretation of the book by Jews and to a lesser extent Christians, according to the Muslim sacred scripture. But most Muslims have taken the references to tahrif corruption in the Quran rather literally and uh, universally in the sense that they believe that the Bible is corrupt, wholly corrupt is the standard kind of Muslim viewpoint. Baha'is disagree with that. Baha'u'llah argued against it in the kitab i Baha'u'llah wrote tablets on those lines. And modern scholars generally, academic scholars, don't agree according to the text of the Bible that the Quran teaches that the Bible is wholly corrupt. Rather, the Quran affirms the truth of the Bible. All the more reason then, one might say, for Baha'is to take that book seriously and have a look at it, as well as having a look at the Quran itself. So the Bible and the Quran all speak about Messiah, or I put an S there to underline the fact that Messiahs are spoken about multiple messiahs in the scriptures of the so-called Old Testament. We don't, we avoid using that term now. We say Hebrew Bible because most of the books in the so-called Old Testament are in Hebrew. A few of them are in Aramaic. There are references to messiahs there, both in terms of Jesus and in terms of Muhammad, in terms of the Bab and in terms of Baal. The same is true of Christianity and the same is true of the Quran and post-Quranic Islamic literatures. So I used this phrase, it came to pass, a beautiful phrase. And uh, it has a kind of loose Hebrew equivalent and the Hebrew is vayehi. That means love, roughly, let there be, it shall be realized, let it be realized. So in the book of Genesis, where it says, let there be light, the Hebrew of that is by Yehi Or. Let there be Or in Hebrew is light, like Nur in Arabic. Let there be light. So in Greek, Egeneto means it happened, it came to pass. And you find that word in Hebrew or Greek about 400 times in the Bible. And that also shows you the degree to which prophecy fulfillment scenarios are present in biblical scripture. It doesn't always have to do with prophecy fulfillment, which is why I quote there Matthew chapter 19, verse 1, which says, it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coasts of Judea beyond, beyond Jordan. It came to pass there. Doesn't very clearly mean prophecy fulfillment, but it might have that implications. Elsewhere, it doesn't necessarily mean that. So there are 10 quotations in the Gospel of Matthew, which is why I referred to that book earlier, about prophecy fulfillment. The first of them is about the virgin birth in Matthew chapter one. And that's based on Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, 
where the prophet Isaiah, 600 and more years before the time of Jesus, spoke or recorded a Hebrew text to the fact that an Alma in Hebrew, a young woman, would give birth and his name would be called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And um, Christians, Muslims and Baha'is all believe in the miracle of the virgin birth. Now, exactly how that happened and what it means is not easy to fathom. And we don't generally go into details trying to figure, it, figure that out. Suffice to say that it's the belief that Jesus has a mysterious origins. And the Quran itself refers to the virgin birth in uh, the Surah al Maryam. And it's, uh, I think it's chapter 19, verse 19, actually. And it mentions that the Holy Spirit did something to Mary such that she conceived Jesus and gave birth to a son miraculously. So the Christian prophecy fulfillment scenario in that first chapter of Matthew is based on the Greek translation of the Hebrew. And it says there that a parthenos, translating the Hebrew Alma, would give birth to a son and his name would be called God is with us. And the word Parthenos means virgin in Greek. And it can mean a young woman like the Hebrew, but for thousands of years, a couple of thousand years, Christians have taken it to mean a virgin. And if you read the Kitab i Agan, you'll find that Baha'is go along with that history of interpretation. So there's a prophecy fulfillment thing we find in the Gospel of Matthew, which probably dates to the first century of the Christian era. It's in the Quran, which dates to uh, the time of Muhammad, the seventh century of the Christian era. You find that in Barbie Baha'i scripture also, which dates to the 19th century. Now, some prophecies, rather like the virgin birth, are complex things, and it's not always easy to find a simple interpretation, like the name Baha, the word Baha'u'llah, according to that prayer that we read earlier, is so kind of obvious that it's almost in your face. Baha'u'llah makes this point to the Muslim world. He says, how can you sign my death sentence when you're reading a prayer during the fasting month, which five times at the beginning, the very commencement, mentions my name? Wake up, he says. Other things are not so clear. If you have a look during your Baha'i deepening classes at the book of Galatians and epistle of Paul, chapter four, four verses 24 to five, you'll find a complicated prophecy there, which has to do with uh, an allegory making the descendants of Sarah and Isaac, the promised ones, as opposed to Hagar and Ishmael. And it involves allegorical interpretations. And even Paul states that Hagar, one of the wives of Abraham, is Mount Sinai in Arabia. So prophecy fulfillment can be a complicated thing. Testimonia is a hard thing and it requires some study. And religionists in the early days were sometimes hard put to find how the life of Jesus or whatever fulfilled a prophecy. And they went to sometimes endless trouble to find prophecy scenarios that might predict this particular event. Some such texts we find in the Barbie Baha'i writings also, and we'll come to that in due course. One of the words for such proof texts is testimonia. 
scriptural proof texts, a kind of good Arabic Persian translation of testimonia is istidlalia, which means exactly that, something which incorporates prophecies which find fulfillment. And this putting together proof texts to fulfill messianic expectations is an ancient thing, pre-Jesus time. And I want to say a few things about that. And this is one of the things I got completely enraptured with, but I think you'll find some of it quite interesting. This is one of the oldest books of testimonia in Hebrew Arabic dating to the first century, one of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which began to be discovered in 1947. And this is called 4Q Testimonia. And it includes biblical texts, which in one way or another, seem to prefigure the coming of messianic figures in the plural. There are other texts like that, which we've no time to go into that. But among the Dead Sea Scrolls is also fragments of a commentary on the book of Isaiah, whom Baha'u'llah refers to in the tablet to the Tsar of Russia by name as a great prophet predicting his coming. And ancient texts commenting on the book of Isaiah among the Dead Sea Scrolls were found and Pesharim, which means commentaries, it's called the Pesha on the book of Isaiah or commentary. You remember Tafsir means commentary in Arabic. Pesha, like Tafsir, ta, fa, ra, is based in the same Semitic roots. So in there, the reason why I singled this out, 30 years ago when I was a student at university, I discovered that there's a reference to Akka in one of these ancient Dead Sea Scrolls relative to the Messiah landing at Akka and then conquering Palestine. And this is the 4Q Isaiah Pesha, which you can see if you look at this slide here, it says, from his climb from the plain of Akko, Akko is actually the same as, Akko is the same as Akko, to do battle against Palestine. And the man who was given the job of transcribing and figuring this out was this man in 1956-57, around the time of the death of the guardian of the Baha'i faith, he, John Allegro had the job of deciphering this text, this Dead Sea Scroll text. There's a, a copy of the text and his attempt to make sense of it. And he wrote an article, Further Messianic References to Qumran Literature. And within that reference, he says, we must therefore think of the Messiah landing at Akko Ptolemaeus, which is the old name for Acre, as the nearest port entry to the New Testament battlefield of Armageddon. Now, Armageddon probably is related to uh, Megiddo, where Mount Carmel, or nigh to which Mount Carmel is located. So the Messiah comes to Acre, embarks from there, and as we said earlier, Baha'u'llah goes up Mount Carmel recites the tablet and mystically speaking for the sake of conquering through his religion, the whole world, Palestine, Israel, everything else. So John Allegro, who was an interesting figure in British biblical scholarship, a somewhat eccentric one also, and uh, can't, there's no time to go into details about him, but he, was eccentric in the way that he thought that Christianity was a mushroom cult in its origins and published a book, The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. But along with his manifold eccentricities, 
he was a brilliant uh, philologist lecturing in the University of Manchester and did great things in working out and discovering that commentary on the book of Isaiah, as well as the so-called copper scroll, which needed to be unraveled because it was a metal scroll with all kinds of interesting things written in it. And, uh, but he had some eccentric ideas. And uh, he, his successors included this man, James Rendell Harris, who wrote a book called Testimonies in published in Cambridge, arguing that books of testimonies existed prior to the Gospels themselves, and that these texts form the basis to Gospels like the Gospel of Matthew and others. His successor, uh, this is more about him, which we don't have time to go into, there he is with, with uh, um, this man, Galacteon, who was a librarian in the uh, St. Catherine's Monastery, and he that discovered important Syriac texts there. And his successor again, in terms of interest in these testimonia, was this, this person who lectures in a university in America, and in 95, 1999, published this book. And uh, another figure is this man, according to the scriptures, this, this slide is misplaced, and this man also. And recently another testimonial collection surfaced. So to cut a long story short, we haven't gone into details. Interesting books in the field of biblical scholarship about prophetic testimony and their being put into books eventually and orally transmitted in primitive Christian times have been written. Now in Islam too, we also find books of testimony and those testimonies have been spoken about by Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha. This is a passage from one of the tablets of Abdul Baha drawing upon Quranic texts which have to do with the coming of the Bab and Baha'u'llah. And here's another Quranic text which says, faces that day will be radiant, gazing towards their Lord. And the radiant motif there have to do with the splendor and the glory of the Babi Baha'i revelations. There are many hadith on these subjects also, some of which predict the coming of the Bab and Baha'u'llah. This one ascribed to one of the Imams, Qutbah Tutunjia, has it that um, Imam Ali predicted the coming of the one who spoke with God on Mount Sinai. And that's quoted by the Bab and Baha'u'llah scores of different times. So prophets, seers, sages, and poets have all predicted things. Uh, one of the interesting traditions has it that the ulama in Islam are the successors of the Israelite prophets. And you can find that hadith in a book called al kafi The Sufficient. It was also quoted by Sheikh Athan, who commented upon it. And predictions have been made by Muslim ulama, one of whom must be reckoned the great father of Islamic mysticism, Ibn al-Arabi, who in his Al-Futuhat al, al the Meccan revelations, predicts that the Bab, a Messiah figure, will be born in Persia. Baha'u'llah himself refers to Ibn al-Arabi in one of his tablets as the sheikh Akbar, the great sheikh, and affirms the truth of that particular prophecy. So great scholars within the Islamic universe, few of them came to Babi Baha'i faith, but some of them had a special insight into things. One of them was this man, 
Bahá'u'lláh refers to in one of his tablets that some, a trace of the light of love came upon him. He was the head of the Muslim world in the middle of the 19th century. And in fact, a few great Baha'i scholars had links with him. And Baha'u'llah also commented that his years of scholarship sadly didn't allow him to attain the great Baha'i gnosis necessary for complete and true thing. Muslims, like Christians, compiled books of prophecy about the truth of Muhammad and the uh, Islamic religion. And one of the signs of, in the Baha'i writings is that some of the predictions of, say, the truth of Muhammad contained, for example, in Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Bible, chapter 33, verse 2, which has, has a succession, prophecies of the succession of prophets. Uh, that particular prediction includes a prophecy of Muhammad. And uh, Muslims realized that prediction long before the Baha'is. And Abdul Baha sometimes affirmed the truth of Islamic insights into that subject, including predictions about Muhammad. Both the Bab and Baha'u'llah, and I'm going to quickly read you a statement quoted by Baha'u'llah here. The point of the Bayan directed that in the year 19, that's 1852-3 when Baha'u'llah assumed his mission, should write for each other a treatise in establishment of the truth of the cause of Manius Verola, him whom God shall make manifest. So Baha'u'llah quotes the Bab as saying, people, believers, should write books proving the truth of him whom God should make manifest, who for Baha'is is Baha'u'llah. So the job was given by the Bab to Baha'is to compose proof texts about the coming of Baha'u'llah. And Baha'u'llah also himself stated, we decree in this tablet that most of the Baha'i friends should write tracts, al va is the original tablet, in fact, literally understood, of this cause and send them unto the countries, perchance thereby one should be, not be veiled from attaining the encounter with God. So not only the Bar, but Baha'u'llah himself stated, it's the job of Baha'is to write literally tablets proving the truth of their religion. So our work is cut out for us. One of the people who did this big time was the author of The Dawnbreakers, who I feel I should say something about because this presentation is supposed to relate to this subject. If you think it doesn't, Believe me that from beginning to end, in manuscripts as well as in the printed texts, there's much about prophecy and fulfillment in the Dawnbreakers. And the signs of the advent of the Qur'an or the Ari Messianic Ariser are contained in the Dawnbreakers. And from your reading of that book, you will remember it gives eight things about the coming of the Promised One. And there's the first three. The promised one should be a pure lineage, illustrious descent of the seed of Fatima. Fatima was the daughter of the prophet Muhammad, who gave birth to Ali, who gave birth to Hassan and Hussein, and their descendants include the Bab. So one of the things which the Bab and his followers did is that they put together proof texts, testimonia, showing how the Bab, on both his father's and mother's side, a double Husseinid Sayyid, fulfilled predictions. And his name was Ali Muhammad, which also fulfilled such predictions. The many, many hadith have it that the all the, the man, Rajal, from the Ali Muhammad, 
should be the promised one with the Qa'im would be that, the man from the family of Muhammad, the Qa'im from the family of Muhammad. And number four, he's more than 20 and less than 30, and uh, should be of medium stature, is one of those eight signs given in the Bourne Breakers. Here's the original te text which gave rise to that. He is a young man, Shab, of medium stature. The Arabic in the original is Marbu. And that means medium height or medium stature. With a handsome face, Hassan al-Waj. Beautiful hair, Hassan al shaab His hair flows onto his shoulders, rises on his face. The hair of his beard and head are black. By my father, he is the son of the Khairul Ummah, the best of mothers. So there's a glimpse at prophecy fulfillment, and I've just drawn your attention to one text there, or we'll have no time in going on to other things. And I'm uh, just going to say that uh, Nabili Zarandi in Alexandria managed to convert a Christian to the Baha'i religion. A certain Dr. Faris Effendi, for whom Baha'u'llah wrote a substantial tablet. The Lohi Akdas is well known, the most holy tablet, but this other one to him is not so well known. And he's referred to there in interesting ways. And I wanted to add that this Faris Effendi wrote an Arabic letter to Baha'u'llah, which exists, copies of it are in the World Center, and contains a strong affirmation of his messianic fulfillment in interesting ways. So Baha'is then were called upon to write Estedlalia testimonia writings. The Bab himself wrote a testimonia book, his Seven Proofs, which is yet to be fully translated into English. And there are many, many interesting predictions there, including about the year of his declaration and about his coming from the province of Fars, understood to mean the West predicted in the Quranic statement about the rising of the sun in the West. And uh, Shoghi Effendi likewise, in his translations and elsewhere, refers to biblical texts. And among the biblical texts referred to is the phrase ancient of days, a beautiful phrase, which occurs in the book of Daniel chapter seven, verse 9. And Chilgi Effendi used that often to translate the Arabic Persian word Kadim, which means ancient, pre-existent, really old. And uh, I won't, there's no time to go into some of these details now. I just want to draw things to an end by coming back to that tablet to Mirza Abul Fazl Gulbaigai and um, the one to Hardeg and saying that we have yet to have translated for us the vast magnitude, the weight of testimonia found within Babi and Baha'i sacred writings. It's a subject to me of endless fascination since my early days in the 60s when I first learned about Baha'i. And at that time, of course, the only thing on these lines which was available was Thief in the Night, Bill Sears's Biblical Proof Text volume, which came out in uh, 1960, the early 60s, and was available to myself at that time then. Scores of other books have been written. And to finish, I'm just going to draw a few of the names of people who wrote these texts to your attention. One of them is Haji Mirza Haider Ali Isfahani, who wrote a book in that 
with that title, Bafro Irfan, which remains in manuscript. And he begins this text in the name of our Lord, Al Akdas, Al Amna, Al Ali Al Abha, beautiful neo basmala formula, which he drew upon. Hajmati Arjmand, a Jewish convert to Baha'i who died in 1941, wrote his book, Golshani Hakoyek, Rose Garden of Realities, about a 300 page book. His knowledge of the Bible was so great that after a debate with the Christian missionary, the Christian missionary was moved to say he was so learned, it was as if he had written the Bible himself. Abdul Baha wrote several tablets to him, praising the greatness of his book, which sadly has not been translated to date. Another Jewish convert who wrote such things was Johanna Dawood. Another French individual wrote that book. Shirley's great grandfather, the apostle of Baha'u'llah, Mohammed Kazem Samanda, also wrote such books, as did Andeli, the Baha'i poet. He wrote a book for E.G. Brown, which sadly is lost, as did uh, Naim Isfahani, the Baha'i poet. Finally, but not exhaustively in terms of the Eastern Baha'i writers on this subject. There are scores of Western ones too, but one of the purposes of them is to highlight what is the Naba al-Azim, the great announcement. This is the subject Baha'u'llah quoted in that tablet to Mirza Abul Fazl Gulpai Garden. Chapter 78 of the Quran, this phrase occurs. And there, Baha'u'llah frequently uh, refers to this text. When I first thought about giving this talk, all I was going to do was to refer to this text, refer to 20 Quran commentaries upon it, and explain that in the light of different commentaries and what Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha said about this phrase alone. And maybe in the future I'll do that also. But I'll finish by uh, drawing your attention to that very interesting text. Thank you for your patience. And uh, we've tasted a tip of a massive body of very fascinating Baha'i literature. Thank you for your patience. I want to truly express our paramount gratitude to you for speaking on this topic of it came to pass. I mean, if I could just ask you also, um, Dr. Lambden, just please stop the share screen because I really want um, you to be able to also see all the lovely participants who joined. Mm -hmm. But thank you for sharing um, about John Allegro especially. And I love that you also had the names on all the slides as you were quickly going through them at the end, because I know the, the friends who are going to come back and watch this video are going to want to write them down and notate them. And especially for our Dawnbreakers, I know this is long-winded, sorry, but also for our Dawnbreakers participants, thank you for reminding us of those eight signs. And for the friends who weren't able to watch, those are gonna be on slide 68 to 69. So hopefully they will. And obviously, look, you have 224 slides and thank you. I, I can't even express enough how much we appreciate you. And we are looking forward to the next talk on the Surah of the Announcement. So I'm gonna hold you to that one. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have announced that. <laughs> we'll just see. Sorry. Okay. And sorry. I'm, I yeah. Will reveal myself. Yes, please. And I'm going to ask the friends if they have any questions. This is your opportunity to use the raise your hand feature or just wave, and then I will um, call on you. Uh, yes, Jane, please remember to unmute yourself. Yes, uh, Dr. London, I have a question. Um, the the Bab wrote a testimony about the greatness of Islam. Um, is that in English? Because it would help us to uh, to um, promote understanding of Islam. Uh, so, sorry, Jane, I didn't hear your first phrase. The Bab wrote what? Unless, unless I'm mistaken, I think the Bab wrote a treatise on 
the truth of Islam. Is that in English or am I, am I wrong about that? Right. No, no, you're quite right to say that. Thank you for raising that point. What the Bab wrote, and I think this is probably what you're referring to, is a uh, text upon the specific prophethood of Muhammad, a book for Manuchir Khan, the governor, the then governor of Isfahan on the specific prophethood of Muhammad. That book is wholly in Arabic. It's none of it has been translated as far as I'm aware, although when I did my research, I did look at it and translate a few odds and ends here and there. And it's a fascinating text giving some proofs of Muhammad, for example, spelling out the meaning of the letters which compose his name, uh, where he was born, and this and that detail. And that could one day cover a whole session of deepening about the Risala Nubuvat Khaseh. Now that means treaties on the specific prophethood. There are two kinds of prophethood according to the school of Ibn al-Arabi in Islam, the absolute prophethood and specific prophethood. The first kind is a complex thing, but the second kind is a more concretization of the prophet figures who give messages to humanity. So Muhammad was one of those concrete figures. That's why that term is used. And that's where it comes from in Islamic uh, theology and mysticism, particularly used by those of the school of Ibn al-Arabi. Okay, Paul, please unmute yourself. Oh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to uh, ask Dr. Lambden if, uh, here are three, three Baha'i books about the book of Revelation. There's, or, well, they're, I'm not sure that they're all necessarily Baha'i, but I think they mostly are. Robert Riggs, he calls it the Apocalypse Unsealed. Mm -hmm. We have uh, Ruth Moffat's uh, New Keys to the Book of Revelation. Yes. Uh, and I think she actually uh, corresponded with Shoghi Effendi in, in, some, in some aspects of that book. And then there's another book uh, called um, Apocalypse Secrets, Baha'i Interpretation of the Book of Revelation. And if I'm mis not mistaken, I don't think the author's even a Baha'i, which is interesting. But Anyway, I was wondering if one of these stands out in particular as being most worthwhile. Right. Well, they're all fascinating books. I've had them and I've read them a number of times. And they contain very interesting and useful materials here and there. Uh, as somebody trained in academic Bible scholarship, none of these people had that kind of training. And so they are devoted believers sharing useful and fascinating insights, but they didn't go into the, the uh, uh, full dimensions of the scholarly side of things. And there are things which are of questionable accuracy and authenticity in all of those books, along of course with useful things likewise. No book is infallible and correct in every respect but uh, another academically informed book in the future needs to be done on this particular subject. But I'm really grateful that you brought those books to people's attention. If they're still in print, people should definitely get their own copies and benefit from studying those things. Okay, any other questions or comments, friends? Oh, one more from Jane, please. Um, it, it's it's not quite on the subject, but <clears throat> what happened that Christians condemned Jews so much, but Sunnis seem to have escaped the same kind of 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 criticism for their murder of of the prophet's grandsons. I, I don't get it. why why the Christians are so down on Jews and um, and the and and the Sunnis seem to go unscathed. 
Well, this is a complicated and highly controversial subject, but um, we don't know who's punished and who isn't punished, particularly about for doing such things. There are statements in Barbie Baha'i scriptures uh, on these kind of lines, but it would be disastrous, I think, if Baha'is went around making too big a thing of a literalistic take upon condemnation for doing this, condemnation for doing that. We all know that anti-Semitic and anti-Semitic mentality is an awful, terrible thing. And Baha'is have to do everything in their power to move away from that and to help people not to be uh, tainted with even thoughts which are in any way anti-Semitic. And um, anything which we can do to help the uh, removal of anti-Semitic mentality is generally a good thing. And uh, the Bab and Baha'u'llah, the Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha often spoke about the greatness of the Jewish religion, its sacred scripture, and the Jewish people, Baha'is don't for any reason whatsoever condemn the Jewish people. We celebrate their chosenness to some degree and the chosenness who follow, those who follow in their footsteps. That includes Christians, Muslims and Baha'is themselves. And so I hesitate to say a single word on this subject, except be very careful in uh, following these lines, there are thousands of books today which counter ancient Christian anti-Semitic perspectives, which sadly are still alive today, and uh, anti-Muslim perspectives which have to do with anti-Shiism are still rife today in the Wahhabi Sunni world, omnipresent. And anything that we can do to go against that is generally a good thing. So thanks, thanks for raising that, but I hesitate to do anything but say, be careful in these subjects, be loving and accepting of Sunnis, of Shia, and promote the respect and greatness of each of those communities in the best way that we can. When Abdul Baha visited the West, he didn't condemn Islam once, even though his father and the Baha'i community had been persecuted. And Shoghi Effendi followed that pathway in a wonderful fashion. And Baha'is today are not in the business in any way of condemning other religionists, rather highlighting their greatness and celebrating the numerous things which we have in common. Yeah, absolutely. We must strive that look at me, follow me, be as I am. Ben, please unmute yourself. Sure. So I wanted to share something um, about that topic because it, it, it's really interesting. I, I, was, I was a youth maybe 15 years ago and uh, I went to a conference and I was there with a counselor from the United States. And uh, we were having, she just, it was just a talk with all the youth in the evening. And I told her, I said, what do you think is going to happen to the Muslims in the future for what they did to Baha'u'llah? Because we know what happened to the Jews because they killed Christ. And she looked at me and said, how can you say something like that? What are you talking about? She couldn't believe I said something like that. And then I went home to my father and I said, told my father, I said, dad, I said, what have you been telling me for all these years? And I'm gonna share with you guys a quote. I'm gonna put it in the, in the chat and it's really something remarkable. And I'll tell you some more about it. I think, it's, I think it's important because, and this is from the Guardian. So I'll read it. Islam at one time, the pro, uh, progenitor and persecutor of the faith of Baha'u'llah is if we read aright the signs of the times only beginning to sustain the impact of the invincible and triumphant faith, we need only recall 
the 1900 years of object misery and dispersion, which they who only for the short space of three years persecuted the son of God have had to endure and are still enduring. Remember it was the Aaron Jews for 1900 years. Uh, we may will ask ourselves with uh, mingled feelings of dread and awe, how severe must be the tribulations of those who during no less than 50 years have at every moment, moment tormented with the fresh torment, him who is the father and who have in addition made his herald himself a manifestation of God to quaff such a tragic circumstance as a cup of martyrdom. And that's from the Guardian. And that's from Jack McQueen. He's a scholar kind of in, in Canada. So just to, just so the hot and I don't mean to say that any, but but the thing, the Holocaust happened for a reason. And God does have a side, a fearful side. And even in Iraq, my my parents at the time, when the Guardian was there, they built the they built the Hazira, which is like which is basically for all the visitors. And that this was at the time of Shoghi Effendi. And the Iraqi government took over the Hazira in Baghdad. And my grandfather went to the to the Guardian and said, look how much money we've spent, look how much work we've done on the Hazira. What are we to do? And the Guardian told my grandfather, I want them to take it. So just to, on your point, God, you know, th there are things in the faith that happen that God wants to happen. And we don't understand the, 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 the wisdom behind it, but God does have another side of him in which there is torment and there is fear. And I thought it was just incredible because the Baha'i faith is such a faith of love and unity, but you know what? God does, you know, uh, I mean, and, and look at the last page on, on the tablets of Baha'u'llah where he says, if someone claims that he's a prophet before, a thousand years have passed, God will send down someone who will deal with him mercilessly. So there is that side also. And I thought, I think, I just think it's an important kind of to share because, and then I wrote this to the council, this is a counselor. And she said, wow, I'm amazed. This is the beauty of the Baha'i faith where we can all share and learn from each other. So anyways, <laughs> that's just a point to bring up. Thank you so much. And you come from a very illustrious and important Baha'i family. And uh, your experiences are uh, fascinating and interesting. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, my, my grandfather had to smuggle money out of Baghdad at the time. for. The okay, do we have any other uh, questions for Dr. Lambden? Okay, Dr. Lambden, thank you so much. Okay, we will see you all again. At, an, at another talk. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.